Hello. Welcome to Practically Christian. I'm Luke, and I'm here with my friend Jake. Hey, guys. We share conversations that help you know Jesus more deeply and follow him more faithfully. The truth is no one has arrived at Christ-likeness. To grow in that direction, we believe you need authentic relationships and biblical theology applied to your everyday life. We hope that you're encouraged to grow and to live out the biblical truths that we discuss on this episode. So let's get practical and dive into a conversation about the Holy Spirit, the church, and last things. So this is our last class that we are doing in our foundations, um, our foundations class. And what we're focusing on this time is the Holy Spirit and his work, um, the church, and then also the end, uh, because it fits to go at the end. Um, what we've done during this class is we've combined things with uh, the member of the Trinity and then where they kind of take primacy in their role. And hopefully at the end of this class or at the end of this specific class, you'll see um, that the Holy Spirit is living and active and instrumental in the work of the church and in your life. Enjoy. Okay, guys. Um, well, I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then we'll get started. Everyone bow your eyes and close your heads. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time together and for this class. Lord, thank you for all of these people who have been coming so faithfully and for the desire of our congregation to learn and to know you better. Lord, help us to use this knowledge, not just to know it, to follow you um, and to follow you rightly as we know you rightly. In Jesus' name, amen. Cool, guys. So uh, tonight we are going to be starting our last one, which is on the spirit and the bride of Christ, um, the church, and then we'll end up with kind of the end, the end things, the last things. To remember this, um, we have this idea that the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit <laughs> is not the Father. Um, and they are all God and equal as God. Um, so to start out, I have a question for you that you're not going to answer out loud, but I do need you to write down your answer at the top of your notes, which is, would you rather have the Holy Spirit as you have him right now, or would you rather have Jesus as a physical person? Perfect. Um, so the Holy Spirit, uh, sometimes it's funny because when we talk about the Holy Spirit, when we think about the Holy Spirit, I think we have a very clear understanding of who the Father is, right? Partly because he's the Father and he has like a very like, um, very clear title. We understand the Son. Jesus has a lot of the Gospels about him. And then when we go, what does the Holy Spirit do? And we go, he does stuff, I think. Um, or if you talk to a traditional Baptist, he inspired the Bible and that's it. No. Um, but here's a list, um, a list of the things that the Spirit is in charge of doing. That is the work of the Spirit. Um, he's, he's regenerating, he's convicting, he's advocating, he's teaching, he's guiding, he's sanctifying, he's comforting, and he's empowering. Okay. The Holy Spirit has a lot of stuff going on that sometimes we don't see, but um, I think if you read, especially the book of Acts, we see a lot of this going on. Um, and so to start out, I want to kind of give us a reminder that even though we think of, like at the beginning we said, hey, the, the Holy Spirit is, these, is God, that sometimes he can be like the redheaded stepchild of the Trinity. Um, and in all of that, he's co-equal with the Father and the Son, and he's co-essential, meaning that he's so essential that he exists and can't not exist, just like the other members of the Trinity. Um, and part of this comes from uh, Acts 5, 3 through 4. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to human beings, but to God. Um, and this is, I think, a very clear place where we see the Holy Spirit is God inside of us, right? Um, he's not just the one who does, he's not just like a, the super good angel, essentially. He is God. Um, now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit, when we see the word spirit, um, it's the word ruach, 
And in the New Testament, it's pneuma. Uh, both of these words are the words that are translated as spirit. Um, it means breath, spirit, or wind. Um, and it kind of gives us a little bit of the nature of who the spirit is, kind of in this name, um, where we see the spirit, number one, being the life, right? When, when Adam has the breath, the ruach, put into him, he has God's breath fills him and he becomes alive. Um, and he is also like the wind that takes Paul on his journeys, right? This idea of the spirit is active, but he's also kind of like hard to grasp. He's a little ethereal. Um, so I just think that the Holy Spirit, sometimes we, we, he's a little bit less tangible, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. So um, we are going to go through uh, in short order uh, the different things that the Spirit is working on. And tonight, me and Luke were both lamenting as we were putting together our notes that um, more than any other night, tonight is a little bit more of a Bible study in that we are covering so much like small ground that there is a lot of Bible passages. So we're going to be reading a lot of Bible. Hopefully you're not opposed to that because um, that's what we're going to do anyways. <laughs> so um, now conviction. Uh, so this is John 16, 7 through 11. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good, this is Jesus speaking, that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness, and judgment about sin, because people do not believe in me, about righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer, and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Um, so first thing, back to our original question of the night, would you rather have the Holy Spirit inside of you like you have him right now, or Jesus in his physical presence? And Jesus says, it's good, that I'm going away because what I'm sending is going to be good for you. In some sense, Jesus is saying for the church and for you disciples, it's better that you have the Holy Spirit in you than you have me here right now. Um, and part of that is because of all the things that we're going to go through. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting idea where I think, at least for me, when I hear that, I'm like, wow, life would be a lot easier if I just like was following around Jesus all day. But for some reason, and for all these reasons, having the Holy Spirit is better for the church in general, partly because he's not in just one location. And in, it's better for you to have the Holy Spirit inside of you um, than it is to have Jesus physically with you. Um, especially if you think, um, as we'll get to a little bit later, uh, as you think that what it would be like to be a follower of Jesus who didn't have the Holy Spirit inside of you helping you. That seems very frustrating to me as someone who needs the spirit to do well and do right. So um, now in this idea of conviction, um, the Holy Spirit is working in the hearts of believers and in the hearts of non-believers to reveal their sin to them. Um, one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the sin that you are currently in. Um, one of like some of the applications that you get at church sometimes are like pray and ask God to reveal what's wrong, to reveal a lie that you've believed, to reveal if you need to change something, the Holy Spirit's conviction. And also the Holy Spirit draws, he convicts all people before we become believers. He is working on our hearts to draw us towards Christ. Next, um, regeneration. This is a fancy word. It's a theology word. Um, it's just based on the Greek word that's under the word life in the Bible. Um, and the Holy Spirit gives life to the believers. Um, so in John 3, 5 through 8, Jesus answers, uh, this is, he's answering Nicodemus uh, right before his like favorite or everyone's favorite Bible verse, John three sixteen. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit, B, gives birth to spirit, you should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind, right, pneuma, blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. 
So there's two kinds of ideas here. Number one is if we remember we, when we talked about like dead and, death and life in the Bible, that often it's a positional idea, especially in the prodigal son story. It's about the Holy Spirit is the one who helps you transfer from death, from being separated from God to relationship with God. He's the one that inducts you into the family of Christ. Um, he is also our seal of approval um, in Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Um, and then when I first read this verse, I thought of like a jar, like it being sealed. That's not what's going on. Um, it's not talking about a jar and a seal. It's talking about a kingly seal, a stamp of approval. It's, it's saying you, you were marked with the Holy Spirit as one approved, as one who's in the kingdom, as one who's in the family. And so the Holy Spirit is our sign and seal that we are alive in the family, that we are born again. He is our advocate. The Holy Spirit uh, is our intercessor. He um, intercedes for us. Um, so in Romans 8, 26 through 27, if you noticed at some point, I think we've gone through the entirety of chapter 8 in this class because I quote it like every week. Um, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. So the Holy Spirit, um, he proves us, he's testifying for us, and he helps us to, like, if you've been in a situation, especially as a kid, where you didn't know what to say to your parents, and you maybe had an older sibling or someone else help communicate what you couldn't say, that's the Holy Spirit for us. He communicates for us and helps us to communicate with the Father. Um, and he also um, is our advocator against the, the like, accusations of Satan. He's the one that, ad that advocates for us to God against the accusations. And he's the one that advocates us for us to others. Um, he's the one who, it basically, the, the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to keep good relationships in the body of Christ, right? He's the one that helps us think rightly and positively about each other. He is the teacher. Um, now, we've talked about this before. The Holy Spirit inspired scripture. Um, but that's not where it ends. The Holy Spirit not only inspired scripture, he also helps us learn from scripture. Uh, on my own, I am not smart enough. I'm not holy enough. I'm not righteous enough. Uh, I'm not others-centered enough to read scripture and be certain 100% that I'm not putting myself into it. The Holy Spirit's the one who helps me to learn. Um, so John 14, 26. But the advocate, um, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So he teaches us through scripture and he teaches us through our lives. He is our guide. Um, if you've ever prayed and asked for guidance in something, the Holy Spirit is our guide through life. Right? John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. The spirit is the one who is helping direct us individually and the church where we need to go. It's our sanctifier. Um, the spirit transforms us into the image of Christ. Um, this is 2 Corinthians 3, 15 through 18. Even to this day, when Moses is read, this is Paul speaking, right? A veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Paul could write down any clearer that the Lord is the spirit. That would be great. Uh, but he's very much getting at this idea that through, and this is partly through teaching, but also through all of the other things that are going on in our lives, the Holy Spirit helps to transform us into the likeness of Christ, into the image of God. He is our comforter. Um, 
Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating, drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the spirit. For her, the idea, if, uh, if you're really sad as a Christian, all, like if you're, if you're really morose as a Christian all the time, if you're, you're not able to have any joy, you might be doing church and Christianity wrong. Um, because there is peace and joy and righteousness in the spirit that is more than any party that you could go to. Um, so out of these seven, you have to not include in power for this. Uh, out of these seven, which you have on your sheet, which two do you think are the most important? You need to turn to the people at your table and have this discussion. With oh, so finally, um, the church is, or the Holy Spirit is our empowerer. Right, he empowers us, um, and we talk about this a lot. In we we talk about the idea of the gifts of the spirit. Um, Luke was making fun of me a little bit earlier because I used the words charismatic and non-charismatic, um, which is how people talk about them. Except for the joke is that the word gift is charisma, so it's like saying the non-gift gifts and the gift gifts. Um, anyways, but uh, the non-charismatic and the charismatic. Gifts. Um, there's two different lists of ways that the Holy Spirit empowers us. Um, the first one is the non-charismatic gifts uh, from Romans 12, 6 through 8. We have different gifts, Paul speaking to the church, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy. Uh, pause. That's a charismatic gift. We'll talk about it in a second. The rest of these are non-charismatic. Um, uh, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is in teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is in giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Okay, addendum really quick. This is not a complete list. There is nothing that's made me as annoyed as when I was a freshman in college at a Christian college and they were like, here's a spiritual gifts assessment and maybe you have two out of the six of these and it was really annoying. Um, number one, this is not a complete gift list. Um, number two, you will be gifted by the Holy Spirit because that's how he makes the church work. Uh, there is no one who doesn't have a gift. And then there's this other idea is that um, these gifts are not necessarily permanent, okay? Um, and when we talk about the, the next set too, they're not necessarily permanent gifts. Sometimes they are. Um, I was listening uh, to a missionary, this was like eight or nine years ago, I was hearing a missionary talk and she um, was supposed to meet a couple, a missionary couple as well. They were supposed to be in this small town in like Indonesia or Philippines, somewhere down there. And she got there and no one else showed up to this town that she was supposed to go to. The, uh, the couple had had a medical emergency and weren't able to make it. And so she taught for two years in this village. And she, did, she was like not a teacher. She was not trained in teaching. In fact, she actually did not believe that women should teach men. And yet she taught the men of the village. Okay? And uh, she taught and she prayed. She was like, God, please bring someone else who's a teacher. But she taught, and during that time, she said that she felt like she was given the gift of teaching. And after two years, sad story, no one else showed up, um, but it was the point at which she had some people in the village that could take the role of being the pastors of the village and the main teachers of the village. And she said that from that point on, she actually found teaching a lot harder. Um, so that's a good, it's just an example of the idea that God gives us these gifts sometimes for a moment that doesn't mean they're going to be permanent. And they are not the same gifts that your natural abilities are. But often you will be gifted in areas that your natural abilities are. Right? They are not the same as your natural abilities, but often God will enhance your natural abilities to be able to do it better. Um, and the other idea that I really like is that often... Um, these gifts are not for everyone from you, but often they're, gift, they're gifts that are for a specific person or specific people from you, right? Um, if you have the gift of giving, I'm going to bet odds on guess that it is not to give to every single person you see, but probably 
a place in your heart to give to specific people who God brings into your life who need help or to a specific ministry or a specific group. Or if it's hospitality, right, not on this list, if it's hospitality, that doesn't mean that you have to have someone at your house every single night. It might mean that you actually are given the ability to deal with someone who other people find really annoying and you don't find them annoying and you're able to be hospitable to them, right? So it might be that you're given these gifts for a specific time, for a specific person, for a specific ministry. It's not a cookie cutter thing, okay? Now, the charismatic gifts. Um, these are the gifts um, that are more... Uh, I don't actually, flashy. they're flashy. There we go. That's a good, a good word to say. Um, so uh, this is from 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 11. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of those tongues. All these are the works of the one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Okay. Um, I like to say the charismatic gifts are how the spirit empowers us to help each other in ways that are completely beyond ourselves. Okay. Um, and just to, I'm going to explain a couple of these just because I think it, we can just kind of like gloss over them if we don't know what's going on. Um, the message of wisdom this is, maybe you've had this happen before, maybe you haven't, when someone feels like they have an insight into your life that they have no reason to know. I would say that that's a, the message of wisdom. Or when they, they know something and they're able to give you information. Or I think especially um, this would play out in like missionary scenarios where like someone knows something and proves that God has spoken to them because they know something about the life of someone who they're witnessing to. A message of knowledge. So these are extra gifts, and just like the other list, this is not a comprehensive list of all of the things. Uh, we often want to, especially because the Holy Spirit is the wind, right? The Holy Spirit is so hard to grasp. We like to take that wind and put it in a little box, uh, but the Holy Spirit doesn't fit in a box very well. Uh, maybe that's where he gets the name, the Holy Spirit. Um, but all of these gifts are to help us as the church to work together to do the mission of God better, whether it be gifts that are normal and that people wouldn't notice as anything special, or whether it's a gift that is flashy and something that's beyond what anybody could do ever. They're all simply gifts of the Spirit who is working his will through us for the church. Now, the fruit of the Spirit, um, this is our last thing about the Spirit, um, but the fruit of the Spirit, so the fruit of those who the Spirit is working in, right? We talked about sanctification earlier. The, the Spirit is guiding us in our lives. If you are being guided in your life by the Spirit, these are the things that will show up in your life. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance slash patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Right? This kind of goes with the idea of like him being our guide in life. He is. We need to keep in step with the one who's giving these gifts, who's producing this fruit in us. Um, those who follow the guidance of the Spirit will follow it to growth in the fruit of the Spirit. Now, what I don't want you to think is to go, wow, I've been gifted with self-control and faithfulness. Or, wow, these are like my natural really good things. Um, if you are growing as a Christian, if you are being led by the Spirit, there is no option. You will grow in all of them. Like, it's not like I'm an orange tree. I only grow faithfulness. That's not how it works. Um, if, as you are led by the Spirit, you will grow and have all of the fruit because you have all of the Spirit. 
not part of the spirit. Cool? So um, with that, I just want to close and remind us that the spirit in all that he is, um, he's choosing to work in us and through us for the church and for the world. And he's much more active than I think we often give him credit for. Well, Luke is going to come talk a little bit about the church. So now we have jumped off, right? We've jumped off the spirit. Not really. Oh, well, not really. Jumped off the three. What do you mean jumped off the three? Because of God, Father, oh, and Spirit. Yes. yes. Now we've jumped off those three. Yes and no. That's what I was going to remind us of, actually. With each week we made this, um, first week we looked at Scripture and God as Trinity. And then every week after that, um, we've tried to work through this Trinitarianly in the sense of we looked at the Father and how he's the initiator, especially in the work of creation. Um, so the Father and creation, we've kind of put that together. The Son's work is the work of salvation, right? The Son died on the cross, not the Father or the Holy Spirit. But then the Spirit's main work is the church. So now we're looking, uh, you could say we looked at the person of the Holy Spirit, now we're looking at the work of the Holy Spirit. Good clarification question. So I think we're still looking at the Holy Spirit. Like uh, there's going to be a lot of overlap in the next few minutes between what Jake just said about the gift of the Spirit and the purpose. And what is this thing called the church? Uh, spoiler alert, it's not a building. You guys already know that. Uh, so we're going to just draw on um, two of the New Testament metaphors that are used to describe and define what the church is. Um, the New Testament actually uses many metaphors for the church. Uh, the church is talked about as the bride of Christ. It's talked about as the temple of the Lord. We're going to draw on that. It's talked about the body of Christ. We're going to draw on that. But let's talk about the Holy Spirit's work. Uh, I love these verses. They're so uh, loaded up. Uh, Acts 1, 1 through 2. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So pause. The author of the book of Acts is the gospel writer Luke. So when he says, in my former book, what is he talking about? Luke. Yep, the book of Luke. So in my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. If you read these words, what's the implication? What are you going to expect is going to happen in this book? Yeah. More of the same. All right, I'm about to read what Jesus continued to do and teach, right? Um, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. Wait, okay, how's this going to be about what Jesus continued to do if Jesus was taken up to heaven at the end of your last book? Well, the implication as you read it is that the book of Acts is about the acts of Jesus working through his Holy Spirit-empowered body. It's the acts of Jesus, yes, but working through his church, because the book of Acts is all about the church. But because it's about the church, it's about what Jesus continued to do and teach. So similar, I think Jake even read this verse, 1 Corinthians 12, 12, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. A few verses later, Paul writes, if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. So simple point, you guys have heard this metaphor before, so I won't belabor it, but that those gifts that Paul, uh, sorry, the gifts that Jake was talking about um, are for the purpose of empowering different people in the church. And then all those people using those different gifts are supposed to work together to continue Jesus' work in the world. So as the body of Christ, what this metaphor communicates is that the mission of the church is to continue the work of Jesus. So what did Jesus do when he was on this earth? He proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God. He healed people. And then he trained followers. Right? Like those are the main things. He did more than that, but he did at least those things. So what is the church supposed to do? We're supposed to proclaim the good news. We're supposed to work for the healing of people. And we're supposed to train more followers. That's the work of discipleship, which more relates to what uh, Jake will talk about in a moment. And this metaphor, I think, means more when you go through an injury of some kind. <laughs> like, I thought toes weren't that important until I broke one. Right? Uh, you realize, you know, toes are essential. And gets it like when Paul talked about when one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And that's how we're supposed to be as a community. Another metaphor is the temple of the Lord. I'll let uh, Jake pick things up. And right. some back and forth here. So this is where we learned that the church is, is a building. Uh, <laughs> So, um, this is uh, from 1 Peter 2, 
uh, 4 through 10. Uh, As you come to him, the living stone, speaking of Jesus, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Um, Any place in this passage that has quotes around it, um, that's a reference to an Old Testament passage. If you like look on like a Bible app or if you look on Bible Gateway online, it'll have like little footnotes that'll like tell you exactly where they are, or maybe your Bibles might do that as well. Um, They're kind of cool to go look up. Um, So now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So um, if you see like this connection that's going on here is that Jesus is saying, hey, there is the, li-, or is it Paul, Peter is saying, there is the living stone, that's Jesus. And you are also now living stones made after this living stone, right? We just talked about the church is where we get made more to be into the image of Christ. And in this image, we are building the temple that is the church with Christ as the cornerstone. Um, and so the big things here, I think number one, are discipleship. If you think about the idea that the temple was the, the locus, the, the place where people would go to learn. It was where the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable people were. It was where people went to go gain knowledge. It was where the theological debates of the time happened. The church is where there is knowledge learning, where there is knowledge arguing, where there is knowledge uh, parsing things out. And that's a good thing. Um, And also that's part of the process of discipleship is figuring out how to follow, right? As the church, we are part of the temple, figuring out how to be stones that build this place. But as we figure it out, we are becoming this place of learning, this people of learning, this people of living stones. And what do living stones do? What else was the temple for? It was for worship, right? The... The stones, it's talking about you're being crafted to become like the stone so that you can worship more rightly. Your perfect worship is becoming a living stone. And you can come together and worship God. With that, we are going to move into something called ordinances. Um, Ordinances... um, You might have heard the word sacrament. It's just a different word for kind of the same idea. Our two main ones at Creekside are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And ordinances ordinances are symbolic expressions of spiritual realities. There is not, and there is some disagreement among this, which is actually part of the reason why uh, this part right here is not in our statement of faith. It's in our practices part of our statement. It's like, You don't have to agree with us on this to be a Christian because the Catholic Church really disagrees with us on this. Um, That's okay. There are other churches. The Lutheran Church disagrees with how me and Luke think about this. That's okay. But we're just going to express what's going on here. Um, So the baptism and the Lord's Supper are, or communion, are symbolic things that we do that are basically as a community they're revealing or they're expressing something that's already true spiritually and on the inside. Baptism, this is Colossians 2, 9 through 12. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands spiritual reality. Your heart has been circumcised. You've become part of the kingdom. Um, Your whole self 
ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you become a believer, right? We, we looked at uh, John 3, 3 through 5 earlier. When you become a believer, you are regenerated or brought to new life. You're born again. The baptism is a symbol of what has already taken place internally. That's why uh, we talk about, and I think Luke talked about it yesterday, uh, Creekside, we believe in believer's baptism. is because it is a physical representation or expression of a spiritual reality that has already happened. And you are, it is done in community because um, you are letting everyone know not only that this has happened, which is a good thing, but also in some sense, as you have, you're saying, I've joined the church, now you can keep me accountable, <laughs> right? Uh, we just did our whole series of the blacksmithing where we talked about like the community as the anvil and it has lots of different purposes. Um, that's when you're, when you're baptized, you're saying to the community, I'm going to be worked on here. I'm a part of the community of Christ and your local community people that I have done this in front of. Now, uh, I'm going to reference something called the Didache. This is chapter 7 of the Didache. The chapters are really small. Um, the Didache is from about 3rd century-ish or maybe even 2nd century. century. It's pretty early. Um, it's basically a group of teachings that was put together as the church started to become more popular to keep people out. <laughs> okay? Um, there are things in the Didache that are maybe good ideas, but it's not scripture. It's not always correct. Okay? Um, one of the things that they say about baptism that we don't teach is that you should fast for two or three days before you get baptized. Is that a bad idea? No, I don't think it is. But it's not the biblical sign that we see. When people get baptized, the, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch goes, what's stopping me from being baptized right now? And Philip doesn't go, well, we have to fast for two or three days. Um, it's not necessarily a bad idea, but it is something that we don't need. But what this does give us is, I think it's, it kind of solves the debate about if you should be baptized underwater or not, or if you can just be sprinkled on the head or not, right? It says, so this is, this is like their rules, the early church rules. And concerning baptism, baptize this way. Having first said all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in living water. It means like a river. Running water. Running water. Um, but if you have not the living water, baptize into other water, or some say still water. And if you cannot in cold water, then you can do it in warm, I guess. But if you have not either, pour some water thrice upon the head into the, into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's even a version of this that was uh, found in like the Arabic Peninsula that was like, and if you don't have enough water, because you're in the desert, use sand, it's fine. <laughs> so, um, but what we see here is, hey, <laughs> baptism, it's okay if you do it these different ways, but our goal in these symbols that are expressing spiritual realities is to do them in the way that Christ did them. I was talking to Luke, I was saying, if we had a river, we wouldn't be allowed to use the baptismal. We'd have to use the river because it says in living water, but we don't have a, a river nearby, so that's okay. We can... But so this is why we do, it's not the only reason, but it's a good reason why we do baptism by full immersion, right? Because it is a symbol of dying with Christ and raising again. And if you do three, three sprinkles on the head, that doesn't get that symbolism across as well, but you should still get baptized even if you don't have enough water. You know what I mean? So um, all that said, it's okay to be baptized in lots of different ways, but we would say, hey, you need to already be a believer because it's a representation of a spiritual reality. And you should try to, and we try to do it in the way, as close of a way to the way that Jesus was baptized as we can. Now, communion, uh, communing in what? What are we communing in when we do communion? Um, so this is Jesus speaking at Passover. It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. This bread is my body. Then he took a cup, 
And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay. Jesus tells us, and I guess specifically his disciples, but the church continues this and Paul continues this, do this in remembrance of him. And specifically, where is it? Uh, this is my blood of the covenant. We're doing this in remembrance of what Jesus is doing, in remembrance of who Jesus is, and in remembrance that this is the beginning of the new covenant. And he is rewriting the Passover, right? The Passover had the blood on the doors, the blood of the sheep, and then it had the unleavened bread because it was made in haste. Um, and Jesus is actually taking Passover and he's saying, that was the covenant that made you Israel in some sense. This is the covenant that makes you the church. And um, he rewrites some of the symbolism. And I'm kind of a nerd about symbolism. I think symbolism is cool. So there's more, but I took these ones. Um, and I think this is why I really like it to do communion as close to Jesus is the way that Jesus did it personally, right? So the bread is unleavened because Christ's body is without sin. That's why it's ideal to use unleavened bread. We have unleavened bread today because yeast was this, it was like sim symbolizing sin. Christ's body didn't have that. Feels weird to use leavened bread. Uh, the bread is broken as Christ's body was broken. There's a big controversy about this, talking about like there's a prophecy that says that none of Christ's bones will be broken. When, when it says, it's in uh, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul says that the body is broken. Um, it's not meaning like his bones were broken. It's being like, yeah, if you had what to happen to you, what Jesus had happened to his body, you would consider your body broken too. Jesus' body is destroyed. It's broken, just as the bread is broken. Uh, and the bread is one loaf as the church is united as one. Um, and then the wine is red because it is the blood of Christ. It would be really used to use, it would be really weird to use white wine and be like, this is the blood. Wine is a drink of celebration as the death of Christ was a great victory. Um, there is some sense, and I, I think this is also true, that there is some sense that like the bitterness of wine, which sometimes we miss out on because we use grape juice, is like the somberness of what happens to Christ. But at the same time, though, it's a, it's a drink of victory, of celebration, because Christ is winning an amazing victory. And then it's the cup of redemption. Luke was actually just telling me about this. Um, there's four cups during Passover. Um, people, people think that this is the third cup. And that, that's the reason that when, if you saw, like said, Jesus was like, and I won't drink anymore until I return. Um, because the third cup is redemption, and the fourth cup is, oh, what was the word you used? Restoration. Restoration, and the world hasn't been restored yet. That's why Jesus didn't drink that one. Um, so the cup, the wine, is, a, is the sign of the redemption that Christ is doing currently and started at his death. Uh, just a thought. Um... When you picture heaven, when you picture our ultimate hope as Christians, what comes to your mind? I don't want you to answer out loud, but I do want you to think. Um, when people talk about our ultimate hope as Christians, what we look forward to, um, what do you picture? What comes to your mind? And it's an important question for us to revisit um, because what you hope for shapes what you live for. If we have uh, a little bit of time, we'll, we'll work out some of the ethics of last things. Um, so we are talking about last things in this section or the end, um, which is fitting to end this class with the end. Um, last things, the, the technical word for that is eschatology. Um, eschaton, um, eschatology, it's all about last things. What's really interesting in Christianity and in theology is eschatology gets really confusing really quickly because when we talk about last things, <laughs> We're talking about a bunch of things that have already started. What I mean is, we're talking about Jesus' victory over Satan, which has already begun at the cross and the resurrection. We're talking about um, being freed from sin, 
which has already started and already begun. Does that make sense? So it gets confusing very quickly. If you ever study eschatology, you often hear that term, the already slash not yet kingdom of God. Now, for the sake of simplifying things, um, we're focusing almost exclusively for the next bit on all the not yet things, not the already things, okay? So things uh, are uh, having to do with our future, our future hope as Christians. Um, so what happens next? Well, let me tell you, someday, if Jesus doesn't return first, you will die. <laughs> uh, death is what's next for all of us unless we happen to be uh, alive at Jesus's return. Um, now, I believe in many uh, would agree kind of the dominant view is that when you die physically, the spiritual part of you, people have different terms for this. Some people call it the soul. Um, some people call it the spirit. I would just say the part of you that's able to commune with God does live on. You're in the Lord's presence immediately at the point of death. And you continue in his presence until his return. And your body um, is just there, right, in the grave. Now, there, is, are, there are some Christians, just so you know, who believe in soul sleep. Um, I'm not one of those, but they make the case that um, for those who, who die before Jesus' return, for them, it's going to be like blinking. Like, I remember when I was a kid, this used to happen to me. It doesn't happen to me anymore. Now I just lay there for a long time before I fall asleep. But I remember as a kid, I'd be laying there, and then I'd blink. And it was the morning. It's like, what happened? <laughs> and I, a whole night passed. Um, the view of soul sleep says, you're, when you die, you're not conscious. And at the Lord's return, you become conscious again. It's a variation of Christianity. Um, now, my main point in getting going through this is that there's actually a crazy amount of agreement among Christians about what happens, uh, what's coming next. We tend to focus on the areas of disagreement, sadly, and so much so that uh, I remember I was telling Jake about this, that uh, a few years ago I was teaching at CCU when I was a professor there, and I was trying to draw out basically all the things we agree on, right? That um, Jesus will return and the resurrection of the dead and final judgment, and I could tell with some of the kids there, there some of the students that were like, really, Christ some Christians believe this? I was like, no, all Christians <laughs> believe this. But like they had focused so much on when will the rapture be that they had lost sight of all these things that are actually more important than that and that we all agree on. And so again, we're gonna focus there. We'll talk a little bit about the rapture if we have time. But. So uh, what do we all agree on? Uh, we agree that we will die. Um, next, we agree that Christ will return, the return of the king. Acts chapter 1, just a few verses later than what I focused on before. Um, after Jesus had said this, he was taken up before the disciples' very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. These are angels. Angelic messengers said, Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So a phrase you might have heard is that we believe in the personal, visible return of the Lord, right? That it will be the same Jesus that's personal, and it will be a visible return. We believe Jesus is coming back. So if I were to add to this, I would say at some point in the future, our king will return. Okay. Jesus will come back. That's what John tells us. I'll just skip to the most important part. Uh, look, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him, so shall it be, amen. He's coming back from heaven, from the clouds. Uh, next, what happens in the series of events we look forward to is the resurrection of the dead. Acts chapter 24 is Paul um, explaining himself and offering his testimony before the kings. And he says, um, I do admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they, the Pharisees, call a sect. 
I believe everything that is in, court, in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Right? Both followers of Jesus and non-followers of Jesus all will be resurrected. And so I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man, Paul says. Right? And I just think it's interesting I want to point out that this is not um, new to Christianity. This is something that Pharisees believed as well. Um, this is part of the Jewish hope, and Paul even ties it in with what all of Scripture teaches, that there will be a resurrection of the dead. And so, along with the coming uh, king, uh, we get raised from the dead. These things happen more or less simultaneously, so I'm drawing it there. Um, Jesus says, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. It will not be judged. Now, when you, whenever you come across the word judge in scripture, it gets complicated because judgment can be used in like a softer way or in a harsher way. Um, it can mean like make a judgment about or assess. Um, that's kind of the softer way. Or it can mean condemned. And what Jesus is saying, um, those who believe in me will not be condemned what he's saying. Um, but we'll see from Revelation, we, we all will stand before the throne, judgment throne of God. We all will be judged in a sense, but we will not be condemned. Um, he goes on. Um, we'll just skip down here. Do not be amazed at this, for time is coming when all who are in their graves, all those who have died, will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Okay, so you see it? Every single person will rise from the dead. All right, after the resurrection, Jesus, king returns, resurrection happens, and then the final judgment takes place. Revelation chapter 20, John says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, right, now raised up, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, right? doesn't matter if you died on the ocean, right? And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, was thrown into the lake of fire. So we agree. We all will die. The spiritual part of us will be with the Lord. At Jesus' return, we will be resurrected, and the final judgment will take place. This is a throne. Okay? Final judgment will take place. Now, I used to think of judgment as like a fearful thing, and kind of like this whole like, if God really loved us, he wouldn't judge us. You know, that's so mean. Why would you judge all these people? Um, but the more I've studied these things and looked at the various verses, the more I realize that judgment is um, a necessary culmination of this, this story. Um, it's necessary for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons it's necessary is to get us from where our world is now to where God wants it to be. Uh, if you think about... Our ultimate hope, um, this idea of new creation and this God dwelling with us in this perfect paradise remade. <clears throat> um, it's supposed to be a world without evil, right? It's going to be a world without evil, I believe. Problem is, if you want a world without evil, you have to get rid of all the evil doers. No evil doers can be there if you want it to stay a world without evil for long. So if you want this great world without evil, you can't get there any other way besides going through judgment first. Judgment is what the end of all the evil doers. And then you get a world without evil. <clears throat> all of us apart from Christ. Right. Yes. Every single one of us. So that's uh, Matthew 25. Um, the parable of the sheep and goats, right? When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, the main point of this parable is actually Jesus' teaching about how um, 
what really matters is how you treat the least of these brothers of mine. As you did to the least of these brothers of mine, so you did to me. Now, um, that's a really important point. Our point is that the Son, the Son of God, the risen Jesus, glorified, will return and um, bring final judgment. Right? Then he said to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not invite me in. I needed clothes. You did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. Um, so this gets us uh, not only to judgment, but the fact that uh, judgment will reser- result in one of two final states, um, new creation or hell. And I'm not cussing because that's the title of the bad place, <laughs> hell. Um, hell is described in a lot of different ways in the Bible. It's called uh, the lake of fire in the book of Revelation. It's called a place of outer darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, and again, I know it's very uncomfortable to think about people you love or know ending up in this place. Um, it's upsetting. Um, what has been comforting to me as I consider that is just um, the fact that the, that the biggest description of what we have of what the new creation will be like is all about God's presence and closeness with him. And we'll look at some verses that show that in a moment. Um, that he'll be with us in this really close way. And so some people ask, like, you know, like, if God was really loving, wouldn't you just make sure everyone ends up in heaven? And the little parable I like to tell the response is, all right, picture this. There is a stalker stalking this woman, and she wants nothing to do with him. Tries to stop him, tells him no, gets a restraining order, all these things. All right, this woman gets in a car accident. This is a really disturbing scenario. That's not real, okay? This is not real. <laughs> she gets in a car accident, and now because of this accident, she's paralyzed. Like, she can't um, control her body. She can't even communicate. And the guy takes her and marries her. What a beautiful love story, right? No, right? That's terrible. When people say, why doesn't God just take everyone to heaven when they die? That's basically what they're saying. When people are powerless to resist God anymore, he should just take them. It's like, no, the whole point of heaven is closeness with God. And if someone their whole life has said, God, I want nothing to do with you. God, I want nothing to do with you. God, I want nothing to do with you. It would not be loving for God to say, resurrected, guess what? You didn't want anything to do with me for 80 years? We got millions of years together, right? No, that wouldn't actually be loving. That's why C.S. Lewis wrote, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, your will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, your will be done. All that are in hell choose it in the sense that they have rejected God. They're in They've spent their life walking away from God, rejecting him, and he will honor that decision in the end. But that's not the story, hopefully, for any of us here. The story is new creation. Uh, Actually, quiz. uh, Some of you already looked at the verses, so it might be messed up. Uh, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Thank you very much. Okay. And John sees, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Um. What I want to draw your attention to do is that sometimes when we think about last things, it's like, oh, God did this, and then he did this, and then he did this totally different thing. But really, the biblical storyline is all interconnected. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and in the end, he will recreate a new heavens and a new earth. It's the culmination of the story. Um, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, there's no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, so out of the sky, from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, right? This is all about his presence with us. They will be his people. God himself will be with them, be their God, even using the analogy of a bride, right? To get at this. Um, he will wipe away uh, every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So we all agree that on the other side of judgment, um, 
if your name is written in the book of life, you get new creation. I'm going to actually draw new heavens and new earth. This looks like a sun, but I'm trying to show that it's like a radiant earth. All right. It's good and beautiful and wonderful in the way it's supposed to be. And it's interesting that the, the biblical storyline starts with a garden and ends with a city. It's like this trajectory towards uh, fulfillment. Now let's talk about new creation a little bit. Um, when I was growing up, at least I, I was just pictured heaven as this, you know, like floating around in clouds singing worship songs. That that's what heaven is. Um, I don't know what you were taught about heaven, if that's the same. Uh, that's kind of the picture that I was given. Um, maybe we'd be all playing harps too. Um, but actually, when you read through the visions in the book of Revelation, uh, when you read through some other verses, it becomes clear that actually we're looking forward to an earthly, a worldly place. It's renewed and it's purified. There's no sin there, but it's still physical, right? We look forward to the resurrection of the dead. Like, we'll have bodies that are physical bodies and walk around in this new creation and do stuff. Um, and there is a debate, again, so there is some disagreement here, on whether or not there will, this will be a brand spanking new heavens and earth, or this heavens and earth just redeemed, restored, purified, renewed. Um, I am of the opinion it will be renewed, um, this heavens and earth. Uh, there's some key verses that I look at for that. Um, if you want, just read 2 Peter 3 sometime. We don't have time to read it tonight. But study those verses because what Peter talks about there is how the old world was destroyed by water. And this world will be destroyed by fire. And just keep that imagery in mind, right? Was after the flood, did God get like a new earth? No, right? But it was washed clean by water. I think this world will be washed clean by a purifying fire of judgment. Um, there's also verses talking about like how Jesus reconciled to himself all things, whether things on earth or earth things in heaven. Part of his ministry of reconciliation is not just us and each other and humans and God, but also even things on earth. Um, or Acts, um, where Peter's preaching. He says, heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago. Romans 8. Is yes, that. there you go, Jake. Good, good call. I have not seen this last. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Romans eight. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. There you go. So I'm convinced of the idea of renewal. Um, now there are areas of disagreement here. Um, the timing and nature of the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ, the timing and nature of the rapture, the relationship of the nation-state of Israel to other end-time events, uh, the nature of hell, the possibility of redemption for those consigned to hell. Those are areas of disagreement among Christians. But what I want you to see is, like, this is actually, these are really important things. Jesus is coming back. He's going to finish his work. Everyone will be raised. He will judge all, and new creation is coming. So Jake and I have fun arguments about how similar, how different this new creation will be. Um, if you remember the Chronicles of Narnia and the last battle, it ends with um, the old world was destroyed, and now they're going and exploring this new, beautiful world. And then they see like these striking and eerie similarities. They're like, wait, this looks familiar. This feels familiar. And they realize that it's the same Narnia, but truer and more real. And everything the old Narnia almost hinted at, now they're getting to experience. And I think the new creation will be something like that. Um, so quick, funny application. I am of the opinion that Christians do not need to have bucket lists. Because, uh, well, in one sense, you could say, because we're never going to kick the bucket, <laughs> ultimately. <laughs> um, but if you have this little, like, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to die until I've seen this and this and this. I'm like, you're going to have a long time to see those things um, and even better things. 
So Jake and I debate about whether uh, or not there'll be space travel in the new heavens and new earth. Will there still be engineers making rocket ships? Definitely space, no cars. <laughs> Um, now, uh, we didn't save enough time to talk about all these things, uh, but areas of disagreement. Um, these are slides from the class Jake and I taught two years ago now on the book of Revelation. Um, there's four different views about the extent of the thousand year reign of Christ that the book of Revelation refers to, um, as well as how the rapture and the tribulation, how all these things go together. Uh, if you've grown up in the Southern Baptist kind of sphere of influence, this should make sense to you. Um, the idea that there will be a rapture where all believers leave this earth, a seven-year really bad period right before Jesus' return. This is the view of dispensational premillennialism. Um, there's reasons for these titles. I won't get into that. Um, many Christians are also historic premillennialists. This should look very similar. Do you see how similar they are? Get it? Get it? All right? Yeah. In this view, the rapture is a welcoming party of Jesus. So Christians rise from the dead, and as Jesus descends to the earth, they welcome him to the earth. They kick off this thousand-year reign of Christ. This one's more simple. <laughs> this is on millennialism that says the thousand-year reign is symbolic. Jesus is reigning right now, and we're experiencing tribulation right now. And both of these things will remain true until he returns. <laughs> And then finally, some Christians are post-millennialists, which say um, our tribulation is the work of Christians to fulfill the Great Commission. And that through the Holy Spirit-empowered work of the church, one day we will actually complete that mission. And the whole world will be evan evangelized. Um, and we'll have like the kingdom of God on earth. And so this is actually the thousand-year reign of the body of Christ, the church. And then Jesus returns after that. Postmillennialism for a time was the most popular view of Christians about end times. And then World War I happened. <laughs> and they said, oh, it doesn't seem like things are getting better and better anymore. Um, for more on any of these, uh, you can look up on our YouTube page where we explore the book of Revelation. God, we thank you together for your Holy Spirit who indwells us and helps uh, us individually carry on your work, and especially us as a church family continue to work in this world. We pray for the advancement of your kingdom and ultimately the fulfillment of our prayers for your kingdom to come on this earth. Your will to be done here as it is in heaven. We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.